associate at the Institute for Behavioral, uh, Behavioral Health at, um, is it Brand Brandeis. Brandeis University, um, working on solutions to drug addiction and other behavioral disorders. So please welcome uh, Tom Clark. Deisha et al., I want to thank you for hanging in there and making this work <laughs> for the last moment. That's, that's fantastic, and I, I do appreciate this invitation. Uh, I have to commend your adventurous spirit in actually uh, deciding to host this topic. It's uh, not something that's, that's, that's widely discussed in the culture, so I'm very pleased to be able to present what I hope is a good case for causal determinism. Um, I should say that my background is in psychology and philosophy. Since 1998, I've hosted a website called naturalism.org. If you've not been there, you really missed out. So uh, do check it out, naturalism.org, uh, on the web. Uh, you'll find there a talk called, with this, uh, sorry, not a talk, a, an article with this title. Uh, it's also linked at the announcement of this talk event. So you can see sort of in a te uh, text format what I'm about to discuss, although this, I think, actually comes up with some new angles on, on what that article presents. <clears throat> so here we go. I'll give you an overview of the talk. <clears throat> First we'll look at uh, uh, where I'm coming from, which is worldview naturalism. Naturalism is a worldview. I think you'll find it pretty much consistent with atheism and humanism. I think it's kind of the basis for those uh, stances. Uh, so we'll look at very briefly what worldview naturalism is about. Then I'll start with some advisories and disclaimers about determinism. I don't want you to start off on the wrong foot. So there's some important disclaimers and advisories to get through. Then we'll look at causal determinism, what that means. Whether it's plausible or not, it's sort of range of applicability. Then we'll look at ourselves as fully calls of cause creatures, which I think is a naturalistic way to get a hypothesis about who we are. I think you'll, you'll find it commonsensical. Can you hear me all right, by the way? All right, good. And then we'll look at agent, what I call agent determinism, persons as causers. We cause things to happen, and that's something that gets forgotten when we talk about determinism. And then we'll look at something that I think sort of brings out our intuitions about cause and effect and, determin and determinism, what I'm calling the replay. Could you have done otherwise in an actual situation, like right now? Then we'll look at the contra-causal assumption, which is kind of gets into the free will issue. A lot of people think that there are exceptions to causation in some particular way, which I don't think is true, so I'll try to debunk it. Then we'll look at explanation versus justification. This gets into some of the confusions that can arise when people uh, think about being what uh, being a fully determined creature might mean. And then compassion and control. This is, if you look at the Precy way we talk, this is what I hope comes out of a fully causal deterministic view of ourselves. It's compassion and control, very much like the Buddha taught. Uh, he was compassion, not so much control. And then I'll look at addiction, kind of my specialty. I work at the Institute of Behavioral Health at Brandeis University studying drug issues. And addiction is a very nice um, case study of what a deterministic understanding of human beings uh, allows us to access and, and benefit from, and other applications. OK, so that's an overview of the talk. Here are the advisors and disclaimers. <clears throat> Determinism is not a universal excuse. Okay? To understand all is not to forgive all, despite the French saying, to comprendre, to say tout pardonner. Have you heard of that? Okay. <clears throat> I'll take issue with that. <laughs> all laws and ethical constraints still apply. So, whatever I say here tonight does not give you permission to do go crazy, okay? <laughs> Everything is not permitted. But, here's the good news determinism can afford us. What? Connection, cause and effect nexus with basically everything, as far as we know. Compassion and control. 
So what I want to do tonight is to release your inner determinist. So get ready. Here we go. By the way, um, I think what I'll probably go on for about 45 or 50 minutes and then have questions. But we might want to take a break either yeah. at some point. Maybe when I'm done, we can take a little break and then we can take whatever. Yeah. Or you can. Okay. <clears throat> so here are two. I want to just talk very briefly about naturalism, which is where I'm coming from. Here are six questions a worldview should answer. Can you see this in there? Okay, very good. Six questions. If you have a worldview and you take it seriously, and this is what I think at least it should attempt to answer. How do we know what's real? That's your epistemology about knowledge. How do we know what's how do we know our, our knowledge is secure? What exists, given how we know things, what does exist? That's your metaphysics and your ontology. These are philosophical terms some of you might have encountered. I'm trying to sort of translate them into an ordinary language. Who are we, essentially? Human nature and human agency? What kind of creatures are we? How ought we behave? That's our ethics. Very important worldview question, a worldview should answer. And then how can we best solve our problems? Those are the applications the worldview, consistent, viable worldview, should afford us, right? And then what's it all about? What's it all about, Alfred? Let's turn that to you. Maybe you don't. Okay, whatever it is. Uh, Existential concerns, what some people call spirituality. I'm comfortable with that word. Many atheists aren't, but I think we all have existential concerns. So those are the six worldview questions. Now, naturalism, as I presented, um, and others have presented it, answers the questions as follows. Our epistemology has to do with science, empiricism, and public evidence as exemplified by science. So basically where I'm coming from is a scientifically based worldview. I hope you're comfortable with that. I think you know what we are. The metaphysics of what exists, well, <clears throat> if you take science as your way of knowing, nature is the whole shebang. It's not, the world is not divided between the natural and the supernatural. That's what a naturalistic worldview would say about what exists. Human nature, well, what are we? We're evolved natural creatures, physical creatures completely within nature. That's our connection with the natural world. It's complete and utter, there's nothing that separates us from the natural world as we've evolved out of it. And culture is part of nature if you look at it broadly. Okay. Ethics. I want to claim, this is more controversial now, that a naturalistic view of ourselves tends towards, it doesn't prove, but it tends towards a progressive, humanistic, and egalitarian ethics, namely something that essentially involves compassion. And then the practical applications based in the causal naturalistic understanding of ourselves, of science gives us control. So connection, compassion, control, the three C's of worldly naturalism. And our existential concerns, we are put in a universe that is unsupervised. As atheists, humanists mostly, we don't think there's a supervisory agent in charge of anything. The world exists on its own. No obvious meaning or purpose, it just is. Existence transcends the whole, the whole um, idea that there could be an intrinsic meaning to life. It doesn't mean that we don't find meanings, but we're in a wild universe, not a supervised universe. Okay, so determinism, <coughs> here's what we mean, or I would present. Cause and effect, this is, this is pretty commonsensical. Cause and effect, regularities are omnipresent in nature at multiple levels, that's what science gives us is a view of ourselves. And commonsensically too, we find cause and effect operating everywhere at multiple levels, whether it's biological, uh, microphysical, social, or personal. Causal determinism, <coughs> if you're a philosopher, is, the, is it's fairly strictly defined. It's the thesis that there is one possible next state of affairs given the past and the laws of nature. Everything's unfolded up to now, and it's implying, that if it's true, causal determinism says there's one possible next state of affairs that could be the case right now here and everywhere else. That's a very strong claim, and it's probably false in that universal determinism 
It's probably not the case given that indeterminism, probabilistic relations, exist at the micro level, at the quantum level, right? The quantum wave function evolves deterministically, but when you go to measure it, you can't tell exactly where things are going to end up. So there's an intrinsic unpredictability and randomness in determinism at the quantum level. So it seems that there's, this is still an open question. There are deterministic analyses of quantum phenomena. But <clears throat> I'm going to say that universal determinism is probably not the case. But local determinism, the kind that applies to us here now, is a good bet. There are likely sufficient causes for what happens next at the macro level where we live. Okay, so that if we knew enough, we could probably, in principle, predict what I was about to say next. That's a very strong claim. It might not be true, but it's, it's I think it's a good enough kind of, uh, as you'll see, a, a, a practical stance to take. Here's a bit more on determinism. There's no reason to suppose that human behavior is an exception to causal regularities, right? Even if there's some indeterminism going on, it's very likely that there are causal laws that help explain why we do what we do, whether it's biological or social or psychological. The role of quantum indeterminism in behavior, I think it's an open question. Some physicists, uh, have, have, has anyone heard of Sean Carroll? Okay wrote a wonderful book called The Big Picture, I highly recommend it. Sean Carroll thinks that it's quite possible that the quantum indeterminism does kind of percolate up and contribute to unpredictability in my behavior, in your behavior. But I think it's an open question just how much indeterminism goes on as opposed to real cause and effect, which if we knew, we could predict. It. So that's a bit of an open question, but I think what I want to say now, and this would be my premise for what goes on next, for all practical purposes, we can be determinists about ourselves in good conscience. We can assume that cause and effect holds pretty much for what we do, how we become who we are. Okay? So I want to say for practical for we can be pragmatic for all purpose, practical purposes, good conscious determinists. That is, we believe the cause and effect regularities that are operating right now. So I, I hope that's not too implausible. And if indeterminism is the case, then you just have to say that, okay, there's part of what we do that can't be explained using causation. <coughs> and we'll get to that later because it's an important point. So I think we're natural born determinists. We're always looking for causal regularities in the world. Out of the womb, we're, the baby looks around, does ex natural experiments, throws the ball out, see what happens, dad gets it, oh, okay, there's a causal regularity. So I think we're natural born determinists in the sense that we're always looking for causal relations. And an interesting question immediately arises that I thought a lot about. In this situation right now, or five minutes ago, given determinism, could you have done otherwise than what you were doing just now? So we'll, that will come up in the replay scenario. But a few other things first. I want to put us in causal context. This is to make sure we're sort of on the same page that, yeah, we're evolved cause creatures. The biological and environmental conditions set the stage for our personal development. Each of us comes out of the womb, biological environment, then into the larger environment, where have all these influences imp uh, impinging on us, plus our genetic in inheritance, right? That combines, and what do we get? a continuous process of physical, emotional, and cognitive maturation. It's continuous, there's no interruption in it. What, what does this mean? It means that each step in the process is a fully caused function of our earlier conditions. Again, if you want to insert indeterminism a little bit, that it may be there, but as far as we know, our development is a deterministic function of all the influences we've been exposed to. What does this mean? You are the net result of conditions that ultimately you didn't choose. You didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose your, uh, your environment at birth or, or, or in grade school. So ultimately, you can't take final credit or blame for who you are right now. You are not ultimately self-caused. You come from someplace in every aspect of your being. 
You are not causa sui. That's the Latin term for a self-caused end. Of being self-caused. So that's kind of the sobering lesson of putting the personal person in tolerable context. Okay? People sometimes draw mistaken conclusions from this, and the next slide is meant to uh, counter those uh, false conclusions. Agent determinism and control. Human beings, I think we all agree, are uncontroversially causes of things in the world. Right? I'm talking now causing things to happen. We're causing things to happen, or will soon, um, and have been all day. So it's not controversial to say that we cause things to happen, even though we're a fully caused function of, the, of our history. Most of the time, it's a person's motives and beliefs that determine their behavior. I control my behavior as a function of what I want to do by giving this stuff. If I didn't want to give it, I wouldn't be doing it uh, very often. So we can explain behavior as a function of a person's desires and motives. I hope that's not too outlandish a claim. So what I would call agent determinism is that there's a reliable causal connection between, say, my desires, my intentions, and then my behavior that results from my intentions, and then the outcomes of my behavior. So there's a causal connection all the way through, so that if I, if I want something, I can often make it happen and have the effect I want in the environment. That's agent determinism, because I'm determining things to happen. I'm causing and controlling things to happen. So what does agent determinism do? It makes us, as a human beings, Proximately responsible. It makes I'm the most proximate cause of my behavior. So the net result is that we're causes in good standing. Just because we're caused doesn't mean that we don't cause things to happen. So as I said, being caused doesn't undermine the fact that I'm a causer. The, the fact that I'm determined to be here doesn't mean that my actions don't have effects in the world. And it doesn't mean that they're not the result of what I want. They are. So, and this is to be contrasted with fatalism, which the idea, if you've encountered it, is the idea that no matter what I want or do, a certain fate is determined to happen. That's not the case. Even though I'm determined to do what I do, next, the next state of affairs has to do with what I want as much as anything else. So the, the future isn't independent of what I want it to be. I'm part of the causal process that makes it the, the next state of affairs what it is. Okay, so there's a difference between determinism and fatalism. It's a complicated topic, but a lot of people confuse determinism and fatalism, so I'm trying to sort of head off that misunderstanding. We can talk more about that. <clears throat> okay, here's the replay scenario. This is designed to get at your intuitions and have you take it very seriously about what it would mean to be a fully caused deterministic being. And remember, don't leave yourself out of the equation here. Okay, here's an actual situation. Say you're on a diet or something like that. You're in a restaurant and you ordered the chocolate cake instead of the sorbet. This actually happens all the time, right? There are actual situations in which people are faced with this dilemma. They say, oh, I should have the sorbet, but I really want the cake, so I'll have it. Okay, so uh, what I want you to do is conduct a thought experiment and replay this as an exact situation which may have happened to you more or less like I've described it. Maybe not with those exact truths, but some complex situation where you made a choice and perhaps you wanted to replay it. So replay the situation up to the exact <coughs> moment where I chose, or you chose, the, top, uh, the cake instead of the survey. Here are two questions. Might you have made a different choice? Give me the replay. Remember, everything is exactly the same. The history up to that moment is exactly the same. Your biology, the microphysical state of your brain is the same, <laughs> okay? So there's no deviation allowed. Could you have made it, or might you have made a different choice? Could you have made a different choice in that situation, in, a, in a, an exactly replayed copy of an actual Well, we can certainly say that had you wanted the sorbet more than the cake, you could have chosen the sorbet, right? No one was forcing you to choose the cake. Rather, it was kind of an agent-deterministic situation in which 
the net sum of desires led you to choose the sorbet. Okay, but, I'm uh, sorry, the cake. But had you wanted the sorbet more than the cake, you could have had the sorbet, right? I think that's fairly uncontroversial. But notice what's happening. We changed the situation. Because in their actual situation, the net sum of my desires ended up on the side of the cake. And that's what the replay asks you to imagine. Not that you wanted something different, but you wanted the same thing. Okay, but we all agree that if I had wanted something different, I could have chosen a cocaine. But could you have wanted something different in the, in the replay situation? All the history up to, leading up to it is the same. All your brain states are the same. Could you have wanted something else in, the, in an exact replay? How exact? I think I specified it's a microphysical duplicate exact. How, okay. How how flexible? There's no flexible. <laughs> no. It's precisely the same situation. It's right, exactly the same situation. So my intuition is, and I hope you share it, is that <clears throat> no, indeterminism aside, it looks like you would have wanted the same thing and therefore made the same choice in a replay an exact. In other words, there's really no, if you think about it carefully, there's no real wiggle room here, except for indeterminism, if it exists. Okay. So that's a replay scenario. And we, I know some of you probably rival at this. They think maybe, no, uh, our man here is, you know, obviously looking for a loophole. I mean, I'm trying to get the more point of chaos theory. Yeah. How, how, oh, well, there, chaos is actually deterministic. Yes. So, it's, so it's, it's, the scenes, right, the scenes. Okay, let me continue. I don't want to leave time for discussion. Now here's the, sort of the opposite reaction to this. It's what I call, I'm calling the contra-causal assumption. And I think most people actually buy into this assumption. What is the assumption? Or the intuition. The intuition is, yes, it says you could have done otherwise in the replay scenario. Exactly the same. And thus, you can originate causally untraceable action. In other words, if we look at the situation, you can see how everything's causally traceable back in time, right? And results in my choosing the cave. The contra causal assumption is even with my desires, even with the wantings that I have, that I could have somehow transcended that and made a different choice. That's the, why do I call it contra causal? Because it's going against, it's sort of rising above all the causal factors in play. And giving me the power to transcend those causes and originate a choice independent of causation. So contra-causal, right? That's why I'm calling it the contra-causal assumption. And I think if you canvas people, maybe not if I presented it this carefully, but if, if you sort of ask them, okay, if you replay the situation, could you have done something else? They'd say, oh, sure. But if you put it to them carefully, the way I've done now, then I think it becomes implausible. Let's add some indeterminism here. Say that there is some indeterminism in play when I make that choice. There's no next unique state of affairs such that maybe I could, maybe I would have chosen the sorbet even though I wanted the chocolate cake. How weird is that? That's weird, right? I want the chocolate cake, but no, I take the sorbet. Anyway, so that's what indeterminism might allow to happen. Okay. Notice that include your desires, right? All right. So if there's interpretive, yes, you might have done otherwise in the situation because of indeterminism, but what happens is indeterminism doesn't give you more control or responsibility. It means that what happened next wasn't completely a function of my desires. It was something random that inserted itself in the, in the decision process, right? So if you get that, what does it mean? It means that it, the, the fact that I could have done otherwise with indeterminism doesn't make me more responsible or more in control. It means something else might have happened, right? But it doesn't make me more of an author of my behavior any more than I would have been under determinism. And remember, agent determinism. I offer my behavior as a result of my desires. Right? Don't leave the agent out of the situation. 
Okay, so an uncaused causer, which is what this is positing, the contracausal assumption says, I can decide what to do independent of my desires. On what basis? Why would I choose anything unless I had a operating motive to choose it? So wanting to be an uncaused causer, something independent of cause and effect, doesn't do you any good. Not one would have good. If any part of you were uncaused and were in control, you, you, you wouldn't know what to do next. So don't think you want to be an, a causa sui, a self-caused entity. Wouldn't do you any good. It would be paralyzed. So the conclusion that I draw, and I hope persuade you of it, I probably have, is, and this, this is the fulcrum of the talk, it's unreasonable and it's unfair to suppose that you could have done otherwise in a way, in an actual situation, in a way that makes you more responsible than were you fully determined. So when I say, I know this is a bit of a mouthful, but the short version is just to say, you couldn't have done otherwise. And then, but to know when I say that, I've got the caveat about indeterminism. Indeterminism says, oh, I might have done otherwise, but I want to say, but not in a way that makes you more responsible than if you were fully determined. Because indeterminism simply separates you from your desires and your intentions as the, the reliable cause of your actions and choices. So here it is. It's unreasonable. Remember this, it's unreasonable, it's unfair to suppose someone could have done otherwise in a situation that would have made them more responsible than were they fully caused to do it. Now I submit that that's a fairly startling realization because most people think they are above causation. So that's, I'm trying to debunk the contracausal assumption and show you why, just how in a way radical that is given the way we usually think. And remember, if you had wanted the, the sorbet, you would have chosen it. You would have been an agent acting on your desire. So there's nothing disempowering about determinism. I'm just trying to show the incoherence of the contracausal assumption and why it doesn't buy you more credit or blame or responsibility or control. This is all to make you comfortable with determinism, with cause and effect, with thinking make you comfortable with the idea that you couldn't have done otherwise, there's no reason you should in a way want to have done otherwise, except of course you do, you often regret your actions. That's the next step. All right, here we go. Something that often comes up is that when people think, hear that they're fully de determined to do something, that somehow justifies their behavior. Well, I couldn't help it, officer. I was, you know, I was determined to speed down this road. The determinist cop says, yeah, I know. I know you're determined to speed down that road. Yeah. But that doesn't justify the fact that you're speeding, man. That simply says you were caused to speed, and now I, I'm going to give you a warning so in the future you're not going to speed again, at least not down here where I'm in charge. So that's our good determinist cop explaining to the woman, uh, whoever it is, yes, whoever the woman in this case, that no, determinism, causation is not an excuse. So here we go. That you couldn't have done otherwise isn't it to say that you shouldn't have done otherwise. I often regret things that I've done, right? We all do. Okay. That doesn't stop change. Even though I couldn't have done otherwise, given the situation, the exact situation, I often regret that I did what I did and I want to do better next time. So if you behave badly, you should try to do otherwise in future situations. Just because I couldn't have done otherwise right now it doesn't mean I might not do otherwise five minutes from now. For instance, in how I gesticulate. Okay, I'm gesticulating, right? All right, now five minutes from now, I'm gonna try not to just gesticulate. Be calm. See how I do. All right. <clears throat> so our moral compass is still intact under determinism. It isn't a universal excuse or grounds for forgiveness. That is, I, if I was caused to do something uh, bad or unworthy, I should definitely have incentives and reasons to try to do better. Okay, so morality stays intact, I assume in that sense. Like, I guess the idea that to understand all, to understand all causes is not to forgive necessarily, okay? 
So we want future behavior to be better, so incentives are necessary and appropriate, we agree, but what incentives are appropriate? What do people deserve if they behave badly once we understand they're fully caused to behave badly? That might, you know, understanding determinism might in fact affect our attitudes and our policies. So this has its bite. It's not just the philosophical nicety that I'm presenting here trying to adjust your beliefs so that it, those beliefs will actually have influence your actions. Uh, okay, compassion. This is compassion and control. Two things I promised you is coming positives to come out of uh, cause and effect deterministic view of ourselves. The mitigation response, I'm sure what I mean. Tracing the causes of the person and behavior distributes causal responsibility outside the person. We can see this right away. You look at, at someone's a criminal's history and they've been beaten up as a child they've been abused sexually abused yelled at and screamed at whatever the cause you can understand we see the causes of their character being built over time and then we understand at least some of why they did what they did if they uh, uh, raped or whatever I mean, you can think of whatever horror story you can think of there's a full set of sufficient causes of that person and those sufficient causes, when we look at the history, distribute causal responsibility, that is, causal responsibility outside the, the person herself or himself. Because they are not self-caused. As we saw, the person in causal context, okay? You're not self-created, so when we trace the causes, we see the causal responsibility that goes outside the person. So what does determinism do? It undermines the assumption that persons are first causes, they could have behaved otherwise, and so deeply deserve their fates. So what happens, I think, is that the contracausal assumption, which is contradicted by determinism, if you contradict the contracausal assumption, if you understand that we're not self-caused, this, what, do, what does this do? This helps to mitigate, that is, reduce blame, resentment, anger, all the reactive attitudes uh, that are generated by seeing persons as the ultimate source of their behavior, as first causes. If I'm a first cause, then I'm really deeply, ultimately to blame in a way that I'm not if you can trace myself back to non-self causes. So that's what determinism cause and cause causation does. So there's actually experiment, experimental research to support this this idea of a mitigation response. When you tell people about causation, causation, they tend to get less punitive. On the other hand, if you highlight the agent, if you single out the agent, then their punitive res responses are heightened. So I think seeing the, that we're fully caused creatures can help mitigate our retributive attitudes, our punitive attitudes. And this, of course, has ramifications for policy. The basic idea is there but for circumstances that will happen. Had I been subject to what the criminal or this person had been subject to, I would be more or less in their shoes. And that should give us forbearance, tolerance, compassion. It doesn't mean, of course, we excuse this, but it means that we're not likely to blame in the same way to feel as much anger and resentment in the same way as we would if we bought into the contrapausal assumption. That's my, my claim, and I think there's some experimental evidence to back that up. Here's two, squ uh, two quotes from some uh, heroes of mine, and perhaps yours, Spinoza, a philosopher, and Darwin, I think you, you certainly heard of Darwin. Spinoza said, this is about determinism, the mind is determined to this or that choice by a cause, which is also determined by another cause, and this again by another, and so on, ad infinitum. This doctrine teaches us to hate no one, to despise no one, to mock no one, to be angry with no one, and to envy no one. So for Spinoza, determinism was this amazing, um, uh, had this amazing effect, or should, he thought, on on our attitudes. And I agree with him. If you take it in, it can have this, have this effect. It doesn't mean that you're completely immune to anger, nor should you be, but it keeps, keeps the worst of it in check. And here's Darwin from his notebooks. He 
He said, every action determined by heredity, constitution, example of others, or teaching of others. This view of determinism should teach one profound humility. One deserves no credit for anything, nor ought one to blame others. Now, this is a, these are very big claims. They're sort of the, and what ultimately could be the case if we really took this in. No one is that kind of saint, of course. We all we will engage in blame. We will always resent. We will always offend the evil. <laughs> we are just human. But this, this viewpoint is meant to sort of, uh, because it's true, science says, I think what I presented is largely is probably the case. If we take it in, it can affect our attitudes and therefore policy. And here's just one example. Well, I'll talk about control first. That's compassion and control, I'll go through quickly. Understanding and accepting that there is a causal story prompts us to look for the cause, actual causes of the person and the behavior. So just the premise that there are causes should make us curious about, well, what, what did cause it? Whatever we're interested in. Okay. But if you think, if you buy into the contra-causal assumption, you'll, you'll stop at the agent. You'll say, no, he could have done otherwise. It doesn't matter what the causes were. And you can see how disempowering that is, how, how that would limit our control, because our curiosity stops at the person. It doesn't go behind or beyond or outside the person who made that contra-causal choice. So determinism is empowering in the sense that it, it forces us to look at the causal story. And discovering the causes allows us to better predict and control the factors that explain who we are and how we develop. So again, this seems to me fairly obvious, but extremely important. So to be a, a, a determinist in good conscience, I think, gives us many benefits. So if you want to be, if we want more control, being a good determinist recommends itself as a rational stance. If you think indeterminism gets you anywhere, all it does is insert some bit of randomness. If it's there, we should take it into account. That's, I agree. But it's an open question how much indeterminism plays in our lives, and as I've tried to show, it doesn't add to control, it doesn't add to responsibility. So we should be de determinists if we want control. But here's a caveat, being a good determinist needn't imply an endorsement of authoritarian social control. Personal freedom, doing what I want to do, what you want to do, still counts as an essential value. <clears throat> so there's no, you shouldn't get the impression, as a determinist, that doesn't justify authoritarian control. Democratic norms, to me, are still central to my values. But understanding that we are caused creatures gives us, empowers us to actually do better in terms of designing a, a just, open, democratic society. It, it will allow us to uh, make better defenses against advertisers and, and illicit persuasion, among other things. All right, addiction and stigma. Here's a, an illustration of an article. We're almost done. I'm almost done. Article I wrote back when naturalism.org first got started in 1998, and here's the, the title of the, addict, uh, of the article was To Help Addicts Look Beyond the Fiction of Free Will. <coughs> And you can see here, okay, here's the blaming response, the rejection, the anger, blame. And here's on the right where I hope to get you, a more compassionate understanding of the, in this case, the addict. So I thought this was a very nice illustration. And I will just go through a little bit of what, uh, what I've been working on recently in terms of addiction and stigma. The moral model of addiction is that drug addiction is a personal failing, and it's stigmatized because largely because people think that, yeah, you could have done otherwise. You couldn't. You could have chosen not to become an addict. You could have chosen to refuse. It's basically your fault. You end up addicted to tobacco, alcohol, cocaine, heroin, whatever it is. Opioid addiction is huge these days. Many people are dying. So that's why this this issue of stigma and addiction is is front and center for many of us now. So the moral model blames people, essentially, and it's not to say there isn't a moral component to addictive behavior, there is, uh, but it looks at it as a, a personal feeling and stigmatizes it and justifies punitive responses. The disease model has been recently brought up as a way to combat the moral model 
as a way to reduce stigma. If you see that addiction as a disease, then diseases generally are not something we get blamed for. It's a brain disease that compels blood taking, and thus the addict is not blameworthy. Okay? But the disease model has problems in that addiction also involves voluntary behavior. Even if I'm an addict, I will I have to decide how to go about getting my next hit, say, of heroin or cocaine. And that involves voluntary behavior, rational decision making. So it isn't as if agency is completely out of the picture. So it isn't really a disease, I would say, it's a behavioral disorder that involves the brain, but it isn't like cancer or heart disease. It's essentially about behavior. Addiction is about behavior, which involves choice making, which involves rationality, which means that what? We can talk about a choice model of addiction that respects the residual agency of those with addictions. In other words, it recognizes that there's they're still rational in many respects. They're not, they might be compelled, strongly compelled to use substances or gamble, but it doesn't mean that the rational capacities are completely gone by the boards. Okay, so the choice model of addiction has now been suggested as an alternative to the disease model. So you've got the moral model, then the disease model comes along trying to combat stigma, and then people say, no, no, it's not a disease. There are choices involved. Okay, but you can see how the choice model because choices are often thought to be a matter of free will, of strong agency, could lead back into the moral model. So what I think you should do is let's refine the choice model using what I've suggested here tonight. Namely, and this would combat stigma, I hope, those with addictions could not have chosen otherwise at any point in their course of becoming an addict or looking for drugs up until the moment. Again, this sounds, this sounds really radical, doesn't it? They couldn't have done otherwise. So they don't deserve punishment for becoming an addict. They don't deserve stigma. You know, they, if they do immoral and bad things, that's, you know, that has to be addressed. But we understand them from a determinist, determinist perspective, they couldn't have done otherwise. So that, subtracts the kind of blame and deservingness that otherwise would accrue if we thought that they could have done otherwise. So this is, again, it's a ra kind of, from a common sense perspective, from the culture's perspective outside this room, it's a very radical claim. But I think it's science-based. And again, indeterminism doesn't mean that they could have done otherwise in a way that would make them more responsible than were they fully determined. That's that, that bit of verbiage that I think you have to determine. Okay, so let me finish up here. Um, and seeing the causes of choices and addictive behavior helps in treating addiction. That gives us the control. Okay, other applications of determinism. Criminal justice reform it helps to reduce punitive attitudes. Therefore, it's against retribution and harsh, harsh treatment. There's a lot that needs to be done there. And people are working on this from exactly this perspective, actually. I'm not, I'm not in any, by any means alone, in being skeptical about contra, contra causal perception. Social justice, no one openly deserves their privileged or marginalized status. I'm very lucky to be here. We're all, in a, you know, given the global situation, very lucky to be here. We, didn't, we don't ultimately deserve to be here. We're just lucky. Behavioral technology, if you understand cause and effect about human behavior, we can deal with obesity and other behavioral disorders besides addiction. We can take, we can, we're better at environmental action because we'll be able to understand what makes people committed to the future. That's a bit of behavioral tech, behavioral technology. How do we motivate people? That, that involves very detailed work in understanding what, what makes us tick as human beings. And again, it's, it's all cause and effect, but very complex. And then community design, how do we design healthy, safe, flourishing communities? With the behavioral technology can help. Um, there's a book called Nudge, which uh, co-written by a, a recent winner of the Nobel Prize, Richard Fowler, which gets into that. Um, and then the personal and interpersonal applications of this point of view, I think, are manifold. They go very, very deep. Self-compassion, self-control. 
if you understand what makes you tick. If you finally admit that you're not self caused in any respect, that gives you a lot more control. And it lets you off the hook in this way, not morally. <laughs> it doesn't let you off the hook morally, but it lets you off the hook in the sense that you can't suppose that you could have done otherwise in, 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 in a situation as you acted. So that it reduces a certain kind of blame, self-blaming that can be corrosive and last a lifetime. And then sympathy and tolerance and forbearance for others. The same attitude that we have for ourselves extends to others. Extends to others. So this point of view, I think, can really help with tolerance, really help with forbearance, that is, with holding the punish for me. When you feel like stuff, we will, of course, all have, we all have these reactive attitudes that will come up immediately when we've been wrong. When a loved one is harmed, of course, we're going to feel guilt and fear. But understanding that what happened was a deterministic function of conditions that ultimately, ultimately the person didn't choose can help keep things, our retributive attitudes, in check. And that's important because retribution, the desire for punishment, for self aggrandizement, for regret, for, I mean, corrosive. Self blame. These attitudes have very damaging effects if they're allowed to proliferate and amplify. And determinism, I think, can undo that kind of amplification. That's why I think it's, it's extremely important, at least to, to consider this as a way to organize <laughs> your thinking about who you are. Uh, so, I think I've said enough. And uh, so, what I want to say is. Kinder and smarter living through determinism. So there you have it. That's all, folks, and thank you very much. And uh, here's some contact information. The website, a Facebook group. Please join us. We have great discussions there. And then, uh, I think I have contact information here. Yeah, here we go. That's my email address if you want to get in touch. Thank you for your attention. And we can take, uh, we want to take a little break. Uh, I've been going for about We want 15 a break minutes. and then questions? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay. Cool. We'll do that. All right.